we're going to move on to our final panel of the day, uh, which is women do not only have the power to create life, they're able to change and improve it as well. Our esteemed panelists for this panel, uh, for this panel uh, are uh, Ms. Farah Fostok, uh, CEO of Lazard Gulf Limited. Prior to joining Lazard in 2014, she was the CEO and Chief Investment Officer of ING Investment Management. And even before that, she was the Head of Asset Management at NBD Investment Management. Uh, we have, um, I really hope that I'm going to pronounce this panelist's name right, uh, Mojupulia Fadugba. I really hope I mentioned your name right. She's a multimedia artist working in painting, drawing, uh, and socially engaged installations. She's currently a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow 20, 2020. That's a huge accomplishment. Uh, she also just completed her Headlands residency in San Francisco. Uh, and we also have Anastina uh, Menitsa. She's an entrepreneur and CEO of her own company, Hintsa Performance. Uh, Hintsa Performance is a company which helps people unlock sustainable uh, high performance. So uh, Ms. Anastina started her own company after she was feeling burnout from her corporate job. She, she went on uh, to do uh, ultra marathons in the desert, 250 kilometers. Uh, and she found out that that helped her relax and she started a company uh, out of that. Uh, this session will be moderated by none other than uh, the media legend Saiba Audi, who has her own morning show on a short Bloomberg called uh, As Sabah Ma Saiba. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to admit them over to you right now for you to enjoy this incredible panel. So, all the names look alike. Yes, I found my first panelist. Yes, Ms. Farah. And hi. Did I mention your name right? Did I get it right? Close enough. <laughs> Very close. Perfect. Yes. Uh, we're still missing one more person. We're missing Anastina. Anastina. Yes. And Anastina is here. Thank you guys for being here. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you for having us. Oh, Ms. Saiba, you're going to have to turn on your mic. You're going to have to turn on your mic. Left corner. That's a good trick. Where did you learn that one, Hamid? <laughs> I obviously haven't learned it until now. Thank you so much, Hamad, for handing this over. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. It's the last session of the day, so we're going to keep the energy levels high up. We have a fantastic panel here um, this afternoon. Um, incredible ladies, incredible women, incredible leaders, each in her own industry, in her own sector. Um, allow me to do a quick, small introduction as to what we will be discussing or talking about uh, today. The world is changing, we all agree. The future of the jobs market is uncertain. Digitization is proliferating. In a world where total automation seems imminent, when it comes to continuity and prosperity, emotional intelligence is more essential than ever. All the more so in leadership roles. In recent years, the definition of good leadership has changed. In the past, a leader used to be a person with a vision, uh, with conviction, a leader who had good argumentation and also great oratory skills. Today, you pick up a book, any book on leadership, you will find it chocker full with words like empathy, empathy and compassion, empowering, listening, mentoring, and sharing. You would not be mistaken if you thought that they were describing the innate traits of a woman, mind you. Please, I'm not implying that women make better leaders, so let's not jump to conclusions. I am simply saying that women are natural born leaders. Mix into, into what they have innately or what they're born with, mix into that education, health, empowerment, self-expression, and you have a very, very strong enabler of growth, 
prosperity and also continuity. My panelists today will address what women as leaders bring to the table and, and more during the next 45 minutes or so. Allow me to present to you three super leaders in their fields. Hamad has already done uh, kindly done the introductions. If you will indulge me very quickly, I'll just remind you just in case um, someone just joined us a bit late. Uh, Farah Fusto is the Chief Executive Officer of Lazard Gulf. She's based here in Dubai. She also sits on the board of a multifamily office. She has a rich financial background and believes, a, a strong belief, I should say, in paying it forward. Farah develops future female leaders via Tara, which is a global mentoring NGO that she has conceptualized and launched. And I must say Tara is one of such initiatives that Farah has conceptualized, launched and managed. Also on the panel is Anastina Hinsta, who's a second generation entrepreneur. Anastina is the CEO of Hinsta Performance, a family business that her father started some 20 years ago. She is fascinated by well-being and resilience. And there's the trick, that's the keyword. She's fascinated by well-being, resilience, capacity, and also adaptability of the human mind and the human body. And beautiful Modukula Fadupa is a multimedia artist working in painting, drawing, and socially engaged installation. Modukula has a background in engineering, in education and also economics. So she comfortably inhabits the nexus of many disciplines. Welcome everyone. Farah, let's get started. I would like to start with you. So when you sit on the board of a multifamily office, what superpowers that you possess do you call on to pull, to, to pull and help you through um, your board meetings? Thank you, Suba, and uh, thank you to the organizers for having us here today. It's a great pleasure. Um, so I think one of the important things is to listening, and I, and I think we've learned last year that listening is super important, and it's not always listening to give advice or listening to tell people what you think. It's really listening for listening um, and, and feeling what the other person's uh, perspective is. So, you know, the, the multifamily office has 34 uh, individuals or 34 different families represented. Um, so everybody has a very different perspective, a very different situation, and it's really trying to understand how we can align interests um, for the ultimate benefit of all uh, shareholders. So it's been very challenging, um, especially over the last couple of years. Uh, we've had difficult economic situations, we've had COVID, um, so there's been many challenges, and it's really about this compassion that you mentioned it's the resilience, um, it's the determination to know that you're heading in a direction, uh, there may be bumps on the road, uh, but you need to get to your final destination. So what is it that keeps you going? What drives you? What drives what you do? So maybe my background in sports uh, has taught me that uh, at a very young age, uh, and I'm also on my Hensa journey, so thank you, Anastina. <laughs> um, you know, I think I, it's in my DNA to be um, super collaborative to ensure that I am connecting people uh, where I'm understanding what is the value of individuals and bringing the best of people to the table uh, rather than necessarily picking on the negatives or the weak points. It's really bringing the best and the positivity to the table. It's making sure that we're connecting people that can add value in different ways. Uh, and that, you know, probably touches on the leadership challenge that exists today in our world where I believe that it's truly the role of leaders to transform culture, to make sure that we have an inclusive society where we're hearing the voices of all, uh, and the result is diversity, not the other around. It's really focusing on the inclusion piece. So inclusion uh, leads to diversity, as you, uh, as you would say. Uh, Anastina Farah has a sports background. She is well and healthy in her mind and body. Uh, does, is that something that adds <clears throat> to her uh, position of success? And what is this that she talks about adaptability in a uh, time in times like these and managing crises? Uh, a short answer to your first question: Yes, it does add to her success as a leader. And I would go as far as to argue, you know having a healthy healthy body healthy mind adds to our success in anything we want to achieve in life 
you know, be it a leader, be it a, you know, whatever it is that however you define success, um, having the kind of capacity to actually uh, perform up to your full potential, that, that's the kind of, that's the key. Um, so as you mentioned, the company was, um, Hensa Performance, maybe I'll give you a little bit of background, was founded by my father originally. He, he started his work working with elite athletes actually in Ethiopia. He, he did work with long distance runners like Haile Gebre Zelassie. And what he realized there was that oftentimes we think that, you know, uh, well-being or having time for sports or having time for your family or living this sort of more balanced life is something we earn the right for after we worked really hard for many, many years. And he realized that it's actually the other way around. Better mm. life leads to better performance. And that, you know, it doesn't mean you have to, you know, get crazy about sports or, or be a semi-professional athlete like Farah. Um, it, it can be, you know, it's, it's about daily activity. It's about recognizing, you know, what are the areas, the components in your life that add up to that, you know, you know balanced life that looks like you. And, and that ultimately gives you a much better position to be, you know, utilizing those skills that we talked about and that, that you mentioned, Shiva, the, the things, um, you know, that are unique to us as humans, like empathy and creativity and complex problem solving. I mean, we know this actually through science already. We have, you know, physical activity impacts your ability, impacts your memory, impacts your complex problem solving. Sleep has a massive impact on, you know, how, how we're able to think on our feet, how we're able to, you know, um, even actually how we're able to empathize, how we're able to recognize feelings in others and be aware of our own. Um, all of these you know, different elements combined, um, they are not necessary just for our own well-being and you know, feeling good, they're actually necessary for performance. So um, there is this um, greater focus, Wodipula, um, on emotional skills and emotional intelligence these days amongst uh, leaders. Um, and being in touch with uh, the emotional side or what some would have described as, you know, feminine traits was something that um, in the past used to be that uh, you need to block to be a good leader. You, you need to really be, stay focused on the matter at hand, etc. But in recent years that has turned, that has changed. So to what extent does your ability to get in touch with the emotion with your emotional intelligence or emotional skills help you create value from your work that's a great question and um i think as a creator as a creative um i find that the best work i create comes from uh me just really stilling myself and being uh in touch with myself and when I do that I'm able to also listen to other people and find um, what unites us what's universal um, and I think some of our basic needs as humans are just like uh, I think Farah mentioned this it's just to be heard and so um, within the people that you're working with within those organizations um, the idea of listening is important particularly as a leader if people want to be heard and it really is a skill, right? It's a skill you can develop this by um, sort of physically moving and being active. You can do this by just finding pockets in your day or pockets in your calendar to, to still yourself. And um, I find that that's just a really essential component in um, my creative process that then allows me to connect with um, a broader audience through my work. So how does that translate into leadership? How does that translate into you being able to, uh, whether it is the emotional part, whether it is being fit and healthy in mind and body, how does that translate into skills that work for you in the, um, in, in the workplace? Yeah, sure. I think um, when you have empathy for yourself then it's that much easier to have it for others mm. um, and to guide them based on their own needs um, and so your needs might not be the same but just recognizing that other people have um, very specific needs um, is yeah I think I think it's just core to, to leadership and I think also just having the courage and um, since this woman is about this panel is about women as well having the courage 
to take time for yourself because I think in many instances it really does take courage to do that. Um, allows you to just enable others to 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 take that courage as well. Ernestina, it's like when we say you need to make sure your cup is full before you can fill up other people's cups. Exactly. There are so many different different portions of that, and I think that's so true. It's sort of like put the put the oxygen mask on yourself first before helping others. That you know, for yeah. those of us who remember vaguely what it felt like to be to fly around and hear that every single time <laughs> since get on a plane. No, but it, it is so true. I mean, that that's exactly what we need to do. If, if we're not looking for ourselves, how can we look after others? And as leaders, our responsibility is not for the results, it's for the people who make those results happen. And I think that sort of, uh, that, that, that's a mindset that we need to sort of reestablish in a way. Uh, and it's a difficult one to do because we are so mm -hmm. ingrained. We've been, many of us have been brought up in this, in this idea of, of yeah, yeah, climb the ladder and work hard. And once you retire, you'll get time for yourself. Or, or when you have your holidays, that's when you have time for yourself. And in reality, we should be actually looking after our minds and our bodies on a continuous basis so that we can cultivate those unique, the World Economic Forum calls them the unique human skills that are particularly relevant in the fourth industrial revolution with the automation, with the digitalization. We need creativity, we need complex problem solving, and we need collaboration, empathy. And, and those are all outputs of a rested and focused frame. It, it's not the output of, you know, two all-nighters or, or sleeping six hours a night. Uh, it, you know, that, that, just, that just doesn't work. We get used to it. Many of us get used to it, used to performing suboptimally, if you will. And that has also, there's some really interesting research behind this, but it has actually been shown uh, by several studies that individuals who sleep for six hours a night for two weeks in a row, their performance declines as much as for those who actually stay up for two nights in a row. It's the mm. same decline. The trick mm. is for everyone who is sleeping six hours a night regularly, the trick is that we get used to it. Our brains get used to performing at a suboptimal level. And imagine how many leaders are doing this. How many, you know, how many, how many of us are doing this on a regular basis? Yeah. But you, but you hear that from a lot of leaders. Uh, you know, big politicians, they will tell you, I remember I had the, the opportunity several years ago to meet Hillary Clinton and interview her. And she mentioned to me that she only, for example, this is not sleep, but this is food. She says she only ever eats in the car. She doesn't have time to stop and eat. So she gets in the car from one meeting to the other and she's, she eats in the car. Or Margaret Thatcher, she's known for her 20, 20 minute naps and then she wakes up. So these big leaders, are you know pushing themselves hard for a long time and and they're boasting about it as well <laughs> yeah and and we have been for a really long time and, and it's sort of like it saddens me in the sense that you know imagine what these individuals could do if they actually did get their sleep if they actually did you know focus on their on their health and their well-being and then there is also that point that you know we think we can push ourselves and all of us, we can. There will be times which are sort of quote unquote mission critical when we do need to, yeah. continue, when we do need that extra resilience, when we do need to push ourselves a little bit more like an athlete in a race. Mm -hmm. You know, there is that time, but that time cannot be your normal. Uh, we need, you know, moments of rest and recovery in between. We need something that is more sustainable in the long run so that we can, you know, when that time comes and, you know, a, cri a crisis like a global pandemic hits or whatnot, you know, we are able to react and we are able to also kind of lead and collect the, collect the organization behind us so that we, you know, we manage through that crisis, but that crisis mode cannot be our normal mode. So um, I understand from research that you have shared with me as well, Anastina, that women are, uh, we don't need, really need research for that, but women are more attuned to the fact that they need to look after themselves and will give themselves this time. Farah, let me go back to you and let's talk a little bit about when women are asked to step in uh, or, or to uh, maybe s solve a problem or in a time of crisis and what are the things that you have uh, experienced that have helped you um, through uh, hard, uh, hard and difficult times of crisis. I think one of the people that sets the stage very well is Malcolm Gladwell. He said uh, a few years ago, I heard him at a conference where he spoke about the situation that we face today. You know, we've gone from uh, problems can be puzzles or mysteries. 
and our minds, our schools, our institutions have been focused on problem solving because we have had to, not enough data. So we've had to collect data and then solve problems. Well, fast forward, and especially now with the, the speed of COVID and the transformation through technology, we now have an abundance of data and we're solving mysteries. So mm -hmm. our minds, our schools and our institutions are probably not equipped to solve these mysteries. And then you go back to having the diversity of thought at the table, because the kind of data you use, uh, what you use to solve these mysteries is really important. And so you can't have people all looking at the same thing. You can't all have people focusing on the same numbers or the same qualitative data. Uh, you need to have people that are looking at different perspectives and different kinds of information, putting it together and solving these mysteries uh, that we're facing today. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a challenge uh, for many institutions, for, many, for individuals themselves, for the schools that we face. Um, and so, you know, one of the things uh, we, we, we need to do is to make sure, again, that we have the correct data, that we are collecting the right information, that we're looking at with the right lens, if you like, um, to end up funneling and gathering this information. The other thing I would, I would say is what COVID has transformed about the way we work, we've all gone to working from home and we've moved from a model where we can see individuals' input. We can measure and say, see how much time people are sitting at their desks or what hours they're in the office, uh, what work they're delivering. We can't do that anymore. So we have moved from an input model to an output model. We have moved to a model where we're measuring people's time and input to a model where we trust our individuals, we trust our colleagues, and we have to um, we have to rely on the quality of the output, of the timing of the output, which mm -hmm. puts a little bit of an onerous on the individual. And you go back to uh, you know the discussion around uh, self motivation and keeping your health health uh, at the level, making sure you're sleeping enough and you know, myself on the Hinsa journey, I can tell you that in the last couple of weeks, I've been working on my sleep. And it's not that I ever had problems sleeping, but it's the routine of sleep, which is so critical. It's that consistency of routine, because we're so used to the telephones and the screens and checking everything up until the minute we sleep, which is detrimental to our sleep. Um, and so our habits have to be transformed. The patterns are changing and we're living in a world that we're not used to. Our habits have to adapt to this world in the same way that we say, we're now sitting at home in front of screens and the hours don't end. Um, you know, we start in the morning, Zooming, WebExing, Microsoft Teams until the end, evening. And I think until you get into a habit where you, I started walking and talking with teams, with individuals, just to move, uh, because otherwise we just stay in front of the screen for 10 hours. And I can't yep. think there's anything more unhealthy than that. No, I think I think I agree with you, but we are all addicted and a good uh, a good spa is calling <laughs> a good way of mm -hmm. detoxing is definitely needed for everybody. But if you like, you're nodding, you're, uh, you're <laughs> agreeing. And I know that you talked to me once before about the fact that you went through burnout as well. Um, you're an artist. You are absorbing, observing, I should say, and absorbing the world around you. And you're translating that onto literally a blank canvas uh, when you're painting or other medium when you're uh, wh whichever you're working with at the time uh, and that takes a lot of um, mental physical and emotional spiritual uh, puts a, a strain it takes an effort and puts a strain I, I am sure which may lead to burnout so how do you navigate how do you manage all these things and how do you come out the other end yeah, winning sure. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, I, I really like, I mean, so many beautiful analogies going on here um, around games and Farah talking about puzzles and mysteries and collecting data to solve um, problems and, and, and mysteries. And I think as a visual artist, um, so much of what I do is visual in real life, but also digitally. So at some point, I think it's been like six months now, I've been off social media. Um, so to the point about detox, um, what data are you collecting and how, how useful is it to you um, at a given stage? It's really about censoring that and um, knowing when to pull back. 
because you can experience burnout you know in terms of work but then there can also just be an overload of information mm -hmm. that was never really meant for you as well um mm -hmm. and um yeah i think i mean at this stage in in my career it's just about building trust i think being an artist is very much like uh uh, honoring your inner child and what your natural tendencies or dispositions are without any outside influence. And um, so if you go back to your five-year-old self, like what, what were the random things that you liked to do before someone said, oh, that was weird. Um, like that's your true, that's where you'll get your true creative energy from. And um, I think in today's world, it's actually just uh, really difficult and takes a lot of courage to go back to that and honor that in a way that you can express your gifts to the world at, at its highest level. Um, yeah, and so for me, the, the burnout has just been, you know, it's, it's, I've had to do a bit of a detox and um, I always like sort of giving re resources to, to um, for others to, to read through and, and uh, maybe get some inspiration from uh, like texts that I've read as well. Um, but one that I found really helpful is Deep Work by, I think, Cal Newport. Um, and I had read like three or four books that really emphasized the idea of a social media detox. Um, and they did this, like their audience is largely like a business audience. And so, but for me as an artist, I found really um, applicable advice. Uh, and yeah, the idea of deep work and just spending uninterrupted time with your thoughts, with your work and consistently uh, finding spaces to do that, to listen to input that is going to um, directly affect your work and not take you off on a tangent. I think there's a lot of tan tangential uh, behavior <laughs> that we're seeing and it's it, it just makes the data uh, confusing to process and it also just makes it difficult to trust yourself and others. So. I think the biggest currency we have right now is like trust. How do you build trust with yourself and with others? Um, whatever helps you do that, I think is going to help you be an extremely effective leader. Yeah. I think awareness is uh, obviously more than half, half of the problem once you are aware of where you are and how you can uh, get over, over that. Uh, that is half the problem already solved. And since we talk about problem solving, uh, let's just go back to the boardroom for a minute, Farah, and let's talk about how um, and when uh, women are called on. Um, no, let's 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 look at a situation where you have uh, the uh, the woman as a leader. Um, what is she assigned? What kind of role is expected of her? Is it different from that of a man? I know you don't like to talk gender, but like for now, I want to talk. I want to talk gender, and I want to see whether there is a specific role to be played, uh, or a specific role that is assigned. And I want to try and avoid uh, falling into uh, the uh, you know the traditional assignments. And if we are falling into traditional assignments, we need to be aware of. About that. That's why I want to talk about gender because it still happens. So I am of the belief that there is the structural problems that exist in our society and there are the soft skills and the individual uh, then themselves. But, but I don't believe that the individual is the issue. I believe that there are structural issues. Okay. Uh, I believe that we need to see women at every level of society. There's a big focus on having women in the boardroom is a big focus of having women in managerial positions. If you look at the OECD countries, one in three managerial positions is held by women. That's 37 countries. Um, if women who are coming through the pipeline do not see role models, they do not aspire to have those roles. And that is the reason why we lose many women. So it's the circular problem of how do we ensure that we have women not only at the boardroom, but also in managerial positions and also in the pipeline coming through the entire system because we need to have women not only at every level in the organization but across all sectors as pilots in the army wherever sectors we perceive to be only male roles if we don't have women in these sectors and in these uh, areas or in these levels then the girls that are coming through school that are looking up and saying when I grow up, I want to become 
they can't see a woman there and therefore how will they dream that uh, and so that's not happening fast enough for me uh, if i give you an example i sat as chair of the financial service association a few years back i was the only woman on the board um, i don't i have never seen myself as a woman versus a man i've never come through life thinking i need to think, do things differently because i'm a woman and other people in the room are men I've always entered any meeting or any boardroom to say, this is the value I add. Where is the value of everybody else? And how do we ensure that we collaborate and work together to achieve our objectives? It has never been a male female. But when I arrived in the Middle East in 2005, there was an abundance of women that asked me for 30 minutes of my time to explain to me their problems. And I didn't know what I could do in 30 minutes. I didn't know how I could help them and how I could, whether I was the right person to help them. And that's when I went down the path since 2005 to think about how do we create this structural programs to mentor the next generation of female leaders where both men and women both feel obliged and a part of their role to mentor the next generation. Because that way, as leaders, you start to hear the problems that individuals are facing, you start to hear their challenges, you start to understand how you can be part of the solution. And to me, yeah. creating an, a, a, a society or a culture of inclusion means using or putting women as the solution. We're not a problem that needs to be solved. We're actually a solution that adds value to economies, to GDPs. We've seen all the numbers to the spending power. We need to create a equal level playing field where men and women compete equally. So I, I'm not going to go back to the boardroom because I went through the whole society. No, 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 I, no, I agree. Look, I think the boardroom is the problem. I think the corporate world is where the problem still exists and the bigger corporate world because it, we've never, look, we've spoiled. We have never ever had a time where you had more women in positions of power uh, or decision making than you have at this moment and and you know what the good news is we we're almost growing blind to it we're not seeing them as women anymore just like you said i mean think about this the head of the world bank the head of the imf the head of the ecb the uh, uh prime minister of new zealand finland finland finster uh, uh, Anist uh, anistina hey, and jane and fraser finland has a whole government of women. jane fraser Citibank, march 1st became the first ceo of an institution yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, I think the corporate world is, follow, is, is following uh, what is happening on the even the bigger stage. So it's all positive news. Uh, have, having said that, we're still way too far from that 30% number that I know that you, Farah, also is very um, enthusiastic about the 30% women on boards. And that's what needs to be picked up more trusted women's capabilities uh, in running uh, the businesses, in managing the conflicts and achieving the continuity and, and so on. Anastina, what do you think? I think that's a really, really interesting point. And, and um, yes, I agree with you say that we're heading in the right direction in terms of like seeing more women in the position of power, not nearly enough. And, and what kind of worries me, but if I can, I can voice this out is, is that um, this pandemic that we have been going through doesn't treat or hasn't treated men and women equally. So when we moved into this working from home mode, it was pretty evident uh, who would be the one who would also be responsible for homeschooling kids primarily, who would be the one who is responsible for like uh, making, making sure that things run smoothly at home when, when a lot of the support networks were suddenly gone. Etc. Etc. So suddenly that all falls on the shoulders of the typically, just typically, a woman. And, and there has been, you know, uh, some, some pre preliminary studies saying that we have actually backtracked years in terms of gender equality uh, because of COVID and because of the home, working from home environment. And, and that is something that, you know, we just need to be really, really mindful of. Um, yeah, I think, um... Majpula, I think there's a saying that one of the challenges in the path of women is women themselves. How do you find that? That's a, uh, wow. <laughs> um, I, I think 
at certain times in my life or maybe in my experiences, I probably would have agreed with that. But as we're all saying on this panel, like a lot is changing, a lot has changed. And um, that's also in part due to the support that women give other women, right? And um, allowing women to be heard and seen first to actually would come from other women, you know, giving uh, um, women the space to do that. Um, I mean, my work actually deals a lot with this. So I paint synchronized swimmers. And um, the idea is that the swimmer is a metaphor for the artist. And so you have all of these women sort of underwater doing very complex movements and they're very strong, capable, athletic, flexible um, and resilient women uh, lifting one another up and doing these beautiful stunts in front of sort of national audiences. Um, and so definitely I, I, I agree that there's space for women to just allow more space uh, for other women to feel seen and heard and to, to, um, to lift them up. Yep. Tara, you're big on mentoring and you obviously Tara is a great mentoring platform. Um, do you find, uh, which is the, the biggest challenge when you're putting up this platform for mentoring? Is it the supply side or the demand side? Interesting enough, I think, uh, well, I think we, we're touching on some really interesting topics. I mean, lift, women lifting women is absolutely critical. Uh, I'm not gonna quote Madeleine Albright, but I mean, women lifting women is absolutely essential. Um, the challenge I think is more from the demand side. Uh, supply, there is abundance of supply. There is incredible women out there at every level of the organization coming out of universities, whether it's through STEM subjects or other subjects. Um, we met, we focus on mentoring women. So, you know, we held a session in January with 1,100 female university students from Asia, Middle East, and the UK. Some of these girls were actually on um, the panels. And they were phenomenal. I mean, exceptional. We had a, a, a young lady from Saudi moderating in one of the panels, outstanding. Um, so I don't think the supply is an issue. Uh, clearly individuals, male or female, need to continue investing throughout their careers, in their education, in their soft skills, in their well-being. That's just a continuous journey, but I don't think it's anything specifically just more for the women than the men. Uh, I think women get a little bit distracted and do less of it uh, than men do because of whether it's children or whatever it may be. And so there needs to be a continuous focus to invest in ourselves. Um, one thing that I think men do better than women uh, is networking. I think men tend to build professional networks. And again, whether that's a time constraint, whether it's because of sports after, after work, uh, whether it's drinking after work, whatever it may be, there are activities that men do and they naturally build professional networks better than we do. And I think that's something that we have to be very conscious uh, that is super important that we build out these networks of uh, individuals that we meet, that we're interested, that we're learning from each other. Um, and so the demand side for me is something that is beginning to change. When you have some of the largest capital allocators, and I'm talking from the investment perspective, some of the largest pension funds and sovereign wealth funds around the world, putting up their hand and saying, we no longer want to invest in companies or work with asset managers that do not have a diverse uh, board of directors or diverse group um, of management, then it starts to put pressure. So, you know, we are already beginning to hear from some of the largest capital allocators that our portfolio companies need to have, be, have to be compliant in terms of ESG. The S is the social piece, which touches on the gender piece. Uh, yeah. There are individuals creating scorecards. Some are more advanced than others, but the dialogue has already started. And the demand side is beginning to put pressure yes, in some countries more than others on uh, asset management companies, on portfolio companies. And that demand will only increase and accelerate after COVID. Right. Can, uh, Stina, yeah. go ahead. Okay, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I had a question for you, but you go ahead first. Oh, okay. So um, please ask your question after. So I, I think that's a really, really interesting point, Clara. And I think one of the key things to remember just is you know, when we do talk about diversity and the reason why we have the demand side now picking up is because that yields results, that yields financial results, that yields an ROI. I mean, it's the same with sort of like what we see on the well-being side. It's, you know, 
that well-being, focusing on the kind of on the leadership well-being, focusing on the whole organization's well-being, that yields results. Like you know, something that you see in your bottom line. We just recently did a, actually a case study for a financial institution in the Middle East, and we had an 88% ROI on on a leadership well-being program. And uh, it, it's it's things like that that you know, it, it's not just because it is morally right or ethically right or it's the it's the right or good thing to do or values based. It is because it yields results now and especially when we think long term. Mm. So I wanted to ask you if you have siblings. Me, yes, I do. I do. I have five of them. Five siblings. Five siblings. And, but you're the one who is the, you're the CEO of the family business. Uh, correct. I'm, I'm the eldest. So, yeah. <laughs> is it because you're the eldest? I think it's a combination of a couple of things. I'm the eldest. I used to work with my father already early on. Um, so um, I, I didn't mention that, but we do, a, so we do a lot with athletes and we work a lot with corporates and and my father's career really was uh, centered very much around Formula One, actually Formula One drivers. And uh, we used to, we, we coach, um, well, over half of the paddock still, 99% um, of race victories in the last seven years, the last seven years have been won by our drivers. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's a really fascinating world that I got kind of interested in the early 2000s. And uh, it was sort of like a natural pool. We worked very closely with my father already then. And uh, some of my other siblings are all also involved. Um, my, mm. my sister is a performance coach. She, she's actually a, um, a sports scientist by background. So she fits perfectly in. And uh, my youngest siblings are only uh, five and seven years old. So they're not involved yet, but we'll see when they, when they step in. Okay. So um, you're paving, are you paving the way for, uh, other women um, in the company? Uh, are you paving the way for other women in the family to, to join the business? Absolutely. Um, you're acting as a role model, obviously. I hope I am. I really, really hope I am. I mean, look, um, even for us, um, it took a couple of years to build a team that is actually diverse. Like even at Hinsa, it took a little bit of time to kind of get a a team that you know really is um, you know representative of of us as people. So a team that has both men and women of different ages too. By the way, that's also important of different backgrounds, and and we realize that we actually we have to do that uh, in order to you know uh, get to the results that we wanted. Uh, we need that diversity of thought that both you and Farah were talking about earlier, and uh, and I have to say that during COVID. It was the two key women that we have in our management team that really made it through. Um, our CEO was a woman, our head of product is a woman, and they, they did a fantastic job. Um, everybody did a fantastic job, but I, I don't know how we would have pulled through without uh, these two key individuals. So really grateful for their input. Great. Great. Um, what did Piola? Uh, I want to go back to expression, self-expression, because I also, I think that this is another important um, element that needs to be present to achieve um, success performance, to achieve lead, to be able to lead properly, you need to as well be able to uh, self-express. And just going by your work and the way that you perceive the world, and then you, you put that out for the whole world to see. I, Sometimes I'm a bit of an introvert and I sometimes do not want to share my thoughts with the, with the rest. I don't want the outside world to know what I'm thinking or get a window into my mind. But you as an artist, you go out and you put it out there. And I guess as a leader as well, you need to step up and uh, put your ideas, put your decisions, put your analysis uh, and, and your perception of a, of a problem out there and deal with it. Um, in a way, you know, you don't need shyness there. Mm. Uh, do you think, how, how do you feel about putting all your thoughts and emotions and ideas up on a white canvas? Yeah, um, it definitely takes a great deal of um, vulnerability and courage. And it's not like it's a never ending well. You, 
you have to fill that well again before you can you know express that vulnerability and express that courage on a different scale and with uh increasing levels of creativity and innovation um and so that works that 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 comes from i think uh working with people doing a lot of reflection actually because it's 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 always an iterative process you never get it fully right and so there's always an opportunity to go back and analyze self analyze others um analyze the new context uh and so it's like a multi-variable <laughs> problem or solution that you're trying to solve for at a given time um within a given context uh mm. and you know and it changes all the time and i think um i i wanted to also speak because i, I thought it was important to kind of follow off of what farron and anastina were talking about with mentorship and mentoring other women um, and I've had the opportunity to do that, but I've actually found that the greatest impact my mentoring has had has been on other men, like younger men. And um, I think I also grew up in a time, I studied engineering, economics, very male dominated um, subjects in the States. And I grew up in a time where I was encouraged that I could do anything as a woman. Um, and in many ways that made me um, kind of outperform my male counterparts in a very sort of short period of time. I don't think that this, this can be extrapolated generally because I think definitely there's still so much space that we need to make up for the gap between men and, and women's performance. But I have found that like many men were starting to lag behind and feeling a little bit sort of resentful about all the support that women were getting. And so I did find, I have found that reaching back out to men and saying, how are you doing? Like allowing them to also be vulnerable, um, you know, sort of catering for their needs and also just trying to be the leader that, you know, I, I wish I had, or that's like an exemplary leader. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so just for one example, like I have some assistants that have children. And so I decided to like do like a paid paternity leave. And I was like, oh, this is so cool that as an artist, I can kind of like enforce that. And it's not something that's done in, in Nigeria at all. But um, mm. it's also just this idea of allowing everybody to say, I have needs. I too want to be a good father and show up for my kids in whatever way I can, even as an artist. And so just sort of yeah. thinking broadly and in a, in a really inclusive um, way about mentorship and looking out for the people in, in, in your care has just helping me to also just express that as well. So there's going to be male synchronized swimmers coming into my works uh -huh. <laughs> because also my assistants, they, yeah, they say, oh, it's only women. How come it's only women? And I'm like, you're right. Because yeah. I have had a lot of um, men in my life who have, you know, supported, whether that's through like gallerists, um, yeah. through family members, through even friends. I have found like increasingly that like men are also opening up and also just starting to show up better in life. And that reflects yeah. in my practice. Yeah. So now we need to see them in your paintings. It's a, it's a little bit like me. And that was actually my first ever interaction with Farah when I met her several years ago. And uh, I told her I only hire women. And she said, but you said that you encourage diversity and you're telling me you only hire women. I said, yeah, we're, we're diverse women, diverse women. Uh, there are reasons. That's a very long story. But yeah, I think maybe the men need to ap appear in your paintings and they need to appear when we go back to 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 our offices um anastina so is vulnerability a leadership trait absolutely i i think hmm. and it's one of the hardest leadership traits i believe for us to do men men and women alike uh vulnerability is required for for you to create that psychological safety i mean we've been talking about psychological safety a long time we we've probably all read those google studies of you know what's the number one success factor of of high performing teams and it is psychological safety creating an environment where it's you know where it is okay you know to try and fail you don't have to cover up your mistakes you can you know uh it, where it's okay to express conflicting opinions um so that you actually get that sort of you know get to that real solution that, yeah that you're looking for and i think uh vulnerability is is it's a prerequisite uh, for psychological safety mm -hmm. And a really, really hard thing to do, by the way. And, and I think that's one of the one of the things that you know I've seen leaders, um, both men and women, do really well in COVID um, is actually showing uh, vulnerability. You know, especially right, you know, last last year, even right now, 
um, admitting that, you know what, I actually don't exactly know how it's going to go. That's a really hard thing to say as a leader, because in a way you're expected or you think that you're expected to know. And, you know, this is this is what's going to happen. This is how we're going to do it. And in reality, you know, <laughs> wind back a year and even 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 right now, nobody really does. So kind of showing and, and being open about also those insecurities, because everybody else is probably feeling the same. You you open up yourself, you let others to also you know come come to work as they are with their kind of full spectrum of emotions. And then from there, you can actually start working. And, and it's sort of, as, as Madhu Piola said, it is about that trust. You're building trust uh, when you also, also kind of showcase your own kind of weaknesses, if you will. As a leader, is there anything like, is there anything like uh, too much vulnerability? Is there a time when you have to, you know, just put up, put on that um, face, put on that armor? and uh, go out into the world and do what you need to do? I think it's a balance. You, need, you do need both to. I mean, leadership for me, I see it as, as requiring different types of traits. I do believe very strongly that vulnerability is a prerequisite for trust. It's a prerequisite for psychological safety. And it's required and it can be credibly powerful for men and women alike uh, when they do role model it. Um, at the same time, of course, as leaders, you know, people also expect you to, um, and, and we are expected to, you know, make decisions, show direction, um, you know, navigate, help, help others navigate uh, through this crisis. Um, but especially right now, we were talking earlier about like how, how we are more focused on the output right now, how we can't really, we can't be there physically in the same space. We need people also to have that safety and trust in their in their selves as well to make decisions on their own those kind of self-leadership skills are required right now and i think those are really hard to establish if you are coming from a culture of that space more on fear or authority or like you're always expecting to get your to have your manager tell you what to do um that's, that's really hard to do when you're working remotely so farah was there a time when you felt um, you needed to shed one or two of these traits that we have very nicely in the last 45 minutes or so um, weaved together to showcase the uh, strong, uh, the, the good leader that can actually sustain, the good leader that can perform, um, the good leader that can uh, solve problems and continue. So was there a time when you felt not all of it works well together, not all of it works works for you? Absolutely. I mean, 2020 was a year when yeah. a lot of things didn't work for anybody. And I think, uh, you know, we're sitting at home now. So one of the one of the key things, I think, is that we brought people into our homes. So we've become real. And anyone that was wearing the corporate mask has now come off. And we're sitting at home, we're all at the same level where there's no more hierarchy and we are able to engage. And for some people that's worked really well, if they felt intimidated in any way in the workspace, uh, they actually feel safe behind the screen. And so for some people actually 2020 has been an advantage in the way that they are able to communicate more freely. Um, but it's definitely challenged the way we manage our teams it's definitely meant a lot of time coaching and mentoring uh, our own our own colleagues around the world. Communication, interestingly enough, has phenomenally improved for us as an organization because you're able to communicate and meet people over videos that you may not have met before. Um, so it made it's made working with individuals around the world a lot more personable, and it's meant that it's really essential to collaborate because I think everybody has realized that we can do things alone. Success doesn't. Is not, is not a one person. And so I'd like to think that we can transform our organizations and our leadership and our style of leadership to again, include everybody's voice. It's, it, it, I think you hit uh, on a very important point, not just now, you've been repeating that word inclusion from the, since the beginning of this session. And I think that's, uh, ever more important in this time when 
we we find you know as as we learn to appreciate our uh, shortcomings as well as our strengths, and as we redefine leadership and uh, moving ourselves uh, performing at our top uh, ability, moving ahead in the world and taking others with us as as we do. So um, I think I would like to ask each one of you, and we'll start with uh, Modipiola, if you like, and then Anastina, and then Farah, or any order that you like. Whoever jumps in first, you're very welcome. Just tell me whether you think that um, women are actually, it's true that women are, by, the, by their nature, by their nature of being nurturers, do jump in and help out uh, where there are problems, um, that they are capable of managing um, their, managing with performance uh, to good results, and that they are also capable of taking others with them. Just basically final thoughts. And Madhupila, you, you need to unmute. Yeah, I, need to, yeah, I think it's absolutely true that women are nurturers. Um, and I, I think that there are a lot of myths that we're all collectively um, unlearning. And so I don't think there's ever been any doubt that women are capable, right? They're uh, about the capability of women. I would say um, that in terms of nurturing and problem solving, one thing that we could do better is allowing others to be nurturers and problem solvers in the way that we um, naturally or instinctively um, lead others. Um, yeah, so I mean, I absolutely agree with that. And I think, yeah, where there's room is just sort of allowing others a more inclusive way to, uh, to lead in instinctually and, and with love and empathy. So nurturing is not exclusive to women. Please step um, up, men, please step up. Yeah. 100% agree with uh, Maripiola. I, I think, yes, absolutely, women are capable. Uh, men are capable too, and we need both. Uh, we, need, we need that inclusion and diversity that we were talking about. That means both men and women. That means people from very different backgrounds, from different ages, from different, you know, different ways of thinking. That's what we need when we have that abundance of data, when we have that, you know, you know, new post COVID accelerated environment that we're heading into, we need, in order to succeed, we need a diversity of thought. Um, and I, I think that, you know, and, and then diversity of leadership styles too. And, and that does, you know, it requires, um, it requires people from different backgrounds, not just men and women, but people. So I think the difficulty going behind three incredible, two incredible women is that there's nothing left to say. Um, I think that uh, I agree with you. I mean, collaboration for me is key. We don't do things alone. We do things together. Uh, and I would say it's International Women's Day tomorrow where the theme is, what is it? Choose to challenge. Yeah. Um, so I will put up my hand and say, I choose the challenge and uh, I commit to uh, being part of this leadership uh, challenge and change to transform society. Well, thank you all very, very much. I think this was very, very insightful. I appreciate all your insights. I appreciate the different backgrounds that you all come from. We have the artist and we have the performance artist <laughs> and, and we also have um, the financial minded um, person, I'm not gonna use woman anymore because I've been told to, to stop. Um, I, I love the fact that all three women here uh, come from different backgrounds, uh, have different, uh, maybe perceive the world from, see it from different angles ac and acknowledge it in different ways, yet they, they all have commonalities uh, amongst them. And the main one is the fact that without diversity, we are not going to be able to move forward and without looking after ourselves to be able to look after others um, nothing is ever going to actually uh, get to where we want it to go again thank you all very very much Muhammad. thank you so much for the time that you have given us i hope that you, you have uh, found it was a this very great session panel. interesting it was a great panel yeah.
Thank you, Randy. We wanted I learned to, a lot. We wanted to present to you uh, three women from different walks of life, but they, were, they are all testaments to what women uh, can do and are capable of. I got so many questions. I don't know if you guys want to answer them or not, but like, okay. we're good to go. Who's up for answering Maybe. questions? I'll, I'll Actually, start firing. No, I've got them. I've, I know who I want to ask. Uh, so Madhupla, I'm going to start with, um, with you. Uh, you uh, had a background in economics, engineering, and you graduated from Harvard. And you left all that and went into career in arts, Nigerian parents. Uh, I don't know what happened when you, when you chose to tell them, and I don't know like what's going on right now. So explain to me the process. <laughs> you have a lot of context there. Yes, there's a, a lot of context. What is the process? Um, the dis I had always been doing art all along. So even when I was studying chemical engineering, somebody found out, I don't even know how, that I was an artist. And then they commissioned me to do the first ever you know, big piece of artwork in their, uh, in the building. This was like, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, but art had always been a part of what I did and how I expressed myself. And so when you, again, when you look back to your five-year-old self, like what was it that you did unhinged and unhinged? And it was art, like that was what could hold my attention for a long period of time. And so after, yes, a lot of money <laughs> acquiring these degrees um, abroad. Uh, I decided to become an artist about seven years ago. And surprisingly, I mean, when I told my parents, my my mom had always said, oh, I told you you should have gone to the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris. And um, like, that would have been a fun idea, but I kind of thought she was mocking me then. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but when I decided to do it, I think they just had more practical concerns. They're both UN, uh, diplomats, well, they've now retired, um, but those are very sort of stable, um, secure job. Well, not that secure because we lived everywhere. Um, so in terms Jobs. of like graphically, yeah, but otherwise sort of mentally you have this uh, sort of security. And so they were just more, they gave me really practical advice around sort of setting up uh, for retirement and thinking about other investments and just thinking about having balance and actually not overworking because when you're sort of freelance or you work for yourself, the tendency is that you work too much. Um, so they gave me really practical bits of advice and were actually very supportive. And I credit a lot of my success to them and all the engineering economics and uh, education, it still, it, it shows up in my art in really interesting ways and it keeps it fun. It keeps it fun for me. So yeah. Uh, um, one more thing before uh, I move on to the next panelist. Um, how do you overcome procrastination? Because what you do is, is crazy. And to me, like just thinking of like an art piece of, if I were to do one of them, I'd procrastinate for a year before getting started. So how do you, how do you overcome that? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's probably one of my biggest uh, concerns, deadlines. So I just have uh, accountability, whether that's through a gallerist or through uh, like a proposal that I'm submitting, all of these uh, endpoints they have deadlines and so at some point I have to stop because there is something such as like too much you can definitely overwork a surface and like your creation is never really done and so you have to compartmentalize and say this work is done now but the ideas and themes continue and that gives you space wow. to just you know yeah reiterate and 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 move on great great okay I'm going to move over to Anastina uh, Anastina, can you explain uh, to us uh, what an optimal day looks like? What's the best day of the best days that we're supposed to aim to have? How it's supposed to look like? I'm going to be really annoying and say that that depends on the individual. Oh, man, come on. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So, so, I mean, we, we are individuals and, and the optimal day for you will might look different to me based on our circadian rhythm. So we all have this uh, in, internal body clock. Uh, that basically dictates when we are the most alert, uh, and what, when we, when you know, it dictates things like you know when it's the best time for that deep focus work uh, that Mudipiola was talking about, and when it's the best time for you know creativity and collaboration when your inhibitory control is slightly lower. And uh, basically, if you are a morning type, your deep work is in the morning. Um, everyone gets a little bit of a throw around lunchtime. That's a really great time to you know go out on a walk, maybe take one of those. You know, eat lunch, uh, actually eat lunch away from your desk if you can and, and focus on that. Don't, you know, don't take your cell phone next to you. Don't read the news. Don't, you know, ask him on Twitter. 
actually focus on, on that food that you have in front of you. Um, you know, get, get a little bit of vitamin D uh, if you are able to go outside uh, because of the lockdowns. And then in the afternoon, uh, if you're a morning type, it's actually a pretty good time for kind of more creativity, more collaboration, more sort of like problem solving type of meetings. Um, and, that, and that would be sort of like a, a typical day. Um, I think the most important thing is that you do remember that we need moments of rest and recovery also throughout the day. It's not just about the nighttime sleep. Uh, in order to have, you know, something to draw from, uh, like I, we, we, need, we need micro breaks even. Uh, even like between these different never ending Zoom calls <laughs> that we, we are on, uh, we, we, need, we need micro breaks because these are the kind of Zoom fatigue is actually real. Um, it does tax our brains in a different way compared to a normal meeting uh, where you have sort of natural breaks. So, you know, step away from your computer, um, stare outside again, you know, walk around a little bit, stretch, whatever it is that kind of helps you refocus and re-energize yourself. Um, you know, take five minute breaks or 10 minute breaks, 15 minute breaks between every meeting. Um, schedule your meetings that way. They don't have to be an hour. They can be 50 minutes or 45 minutes or, or you know, whatever, a few, few minutes shorter every time. Um, and then obviously, yeah, try and try and get in some activity or exercise. Um, but step counts for all of us, including our clients and including myself a few days every week. Uh, are horrendous. Um, you know, they have plummeted since we are, don't get any of that natural movement anymore. So yeah, do, do, do take time to actually, you know, exercise, walk around daily activity. Again, doesn't so have sleep, to exercise, how long is the, okay, uh, you're going to again say it depends on person to person, but <laughs> sleep, what's the optimal hours? Like how so many? Sleep, sleep actually doesn't depend that much on person uh, okay. to person. That's a really easy one. Uh, every single one of us needs a minimum seven hours. Um, seven to nine hours is probably the optimum. Most of us actually gravitate towards eight. And if you're saying you can do less than that, you're probably used to performing suboptimally. So again, going back to the study I mentioned, um, sleep is not something you can really compromise. And like Farah was saying earlier, sleep is not just about the quantity, it is also about the quality and consistency. So especially right now that we're working uh, globally, um, we tend to also kind of uh, shift between time zones quite a bit. Um, and, and that is basically creating, inducing a state of jet lag. Um, so our body clocks are actually quite, um, quite sensitive in the sense that we do need, you know, ideally we need a consistent bedtime and a consistent time when we wake up. Um, wow. And then finally the quality piece. So like Farah was mentioning, turning off the devices, the blue lights, um, you know, all the kind of distractions, preferably a couple of hours before bed. And then you're gonna tell me that's impossible. And I say, you know, just 30 minutes, anything you can do, um, you know, turn it off, take a little bit of time, create a routine for yourself to switch off. Okay, what about exercise? How long should it be optimum? So the uh, recommendation by WHO is 150 minutes of moderate high intensity exercise per week. Uh, so that's what, I mean, you count it up and it actually isn't, it's, it's not impossible to achieve at all. Um, yeah. So that, that's the kind of like minimum, minimum recommendation. Um, and depending on your age, you also want to start with exercise. What you want to start building is it also strength. So that's an, an important piece um, not to forget. And then obviously, you know, biomechanics, uh, mobility, uh, work ergonomics has been, again, <laughs> another thing that kind of plummeted in, in COVID. I'm hearing everywhere, people with back problems, you know, wow. risk problems, everything. And, and that's another one to kind of like, hey, do yourself a favor and get the setup right because we're probably going to be working from home in the future too. Wow. Okay, I'm going to move over to Ms. Farah Kostov and I'm going to ask you, uh, what you mentioned that you're an athlete. So what sport, uh, what sport are you in? Uh, so maybe the question is, what sport am I not in? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so I play tennis regularly. Uh, I also train every day. Uh, growing up at school, I used to do hockey, rounders, netball, any sport I could find, volleyball. I was in the sport, I was a school sport captain for two years, and I was in my team year and a substitute for the year above. Um, so I'm so, super passionate about all sports, skiing, you name it. So I'm going to ask you to dish some dirt on the Hensa experience. So how is it? So I think you should sign up. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no pitch. I, it's phenomenal. I mean, uh, I just started about um, a month ago. So what does it look like? So you have, uh, you're allocated a coach 
My coach okay. is a, a phenomenal lady who, Finnish lady who's based in Switzerland. She's a slalom gold medalist. And, um, you know, it's little tips that seem very obvious, but they're just little changes to your routines, your daily routine, uh, that makes you very conscious of how you can live better. Um, there's a lot of learning in it. So you have your um, uh, learnings that come in every Monday. So once a week, you have your learnings, you know, you start this beginning for me was the core and now it's on the sleep, uh, learning about the strength and the importance of the kind of exercise you do, not just doing sports. So even though I played an hour of tennis this morning, I also trained and did some strength training. Um, so it wasn't enough just to do tennis. Um, and the sleep routine has been phenomenal. Uh, I really have switched off my phone. I put a do not disturb at 10, 15. And even if it's 15 minutes, half an hour, no, tele no telephone, no blue lights, no any lights. Wow. It's hard. Now, I have to say, honestly, I haven't been consistent, but it's, it's really hard. <laughs> We're, we are addicted to our telephones. Definitely. Anastina looks proud. I am so proud and I just want to wait. we did not this was not coordinated or planned in any way. No, no, it's all so good. Right. So, <laughs> thank so you, Cara. Uh, so I'm going to ask you the final question uh, of the day of your media career has been however long and you've interviewed a lot of personalities. Well, which personality did you interview mm -hmm. and they had this no, hold on. What type I was of, going to say, don't ask me that no, question. I'm not going to ask you that question. You need to you, just listen to me to the end. What type of trait did that person have and you wish you had? Uh, the, oh, a, type, a trait that they had that I wish I had? Yeah. Um, look, every time I interview somebody who is um, determined, successful, and has stayed the course, I wish that I had all these things. I love, each one of us has the, has them in them, and each one of us has had, you know, uh, ha, has seen them at play. We we live through them. I know that I have someone else looking at me is going to say, "Oh, I wish I had her perseverance and her staying power, and, and I wish I had the, her dedication to what she's doing." So it's more or less the same thing. I appreciate excellence, and when I see excellence, I I crave for it even more. So regardless of how much we have, how much we do, it's always um, good that we recognize these traits in others, appreciate them for what they are. And then when you wish them for yourself, it's you're more or less giving, paying them the biggest compliment. Okay, that's a, that's a very good diplomatic answer. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna have to leave it there. Uh, thank, you, thank you, ladies, very much. It's been an incredible panel. We had a lot of fun. It was really informative. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, ladies. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Seba. Thank you, guys.